Hello, my name is Zahid al I'm part of Commodore Product Management here, and in this section, we're going to talk about uh, the various virtual machine lifecycle management tools and techniques that we've incorporated in the Simpana Data Protection Platform uh, as part of um, as part of our data protection activities over here for virtual machines. Now, this is kind of a rehash, but basically, this is another survey that we kind of did based on uh, information that we collect. On, on usage patterns and everything else, what we found is that if you look at your VM usage profile, this is how it basically breaks up. You have your gold class VMs, which is basically 10% of the 10% of VMs, about 30 to 40 percent of the data set sits behind these gold class VMs. Then you have your silver class VMs, which have a typical profile, and then you have bronze class VMs over there. But is that all? What we found is that in very large environments, actually just the tip of the iceberg, especially in very, very virtualized environments where they've got very, very sophisticated in their server management and the VM management processes to the point that they've gone ahead and allowed end users to carve up their own machines. So Comval is, is a good example of that. All of our tests, we have a huge engineering department out here in New Jersey, and everything that they do is on virtual server platforms. And they've been empowered to basically go create as many virtual machines as they need and use them as, for, as, as, as often as they want and so on and so forth. So basically there is no physical server profile anymore from a dev perspective. Everything that they do has to be on virtual machine. That's a mandate. Now, the problem with that is, and we all know developers are very, very, very uh, good at creating net new stuff when it goes back and cleaning up your desk or cleaning up something over there or cleaning up comments in the code, um, not very good at it. And it's the same thing with virtual machines too. You go up there, you spin up all these VMs, you use, make heavy use of them for about five weeks or so, and after that, what? Nothing. They're just sitting over there, sitting idle, not doing anything, just consuming a lot of expensive uh, storage in the front and the back there. Right? Now, if you are a VM admin or if you're a storage admin, how do you tell? How do you know which VMs are actually being used and which are not? Especially when things like Patch Tuesdays happen. You have a whole bunch of Microsoft servers in there, Patch Tuesday happens, everything goes in, spikes everything up, and then you're done. Right? So how do you know from the back end without having any context what those VMs are? So you're still going in there, you've done my, your automatic discovery, you're basically saying, yeah, this is engineering work, engineering stuff, test dev stuff, there's probably some very super, super sensitive code that's sitting on there, I better back it up. Or this super, super, you know, whatever variant of build over there that I better back it up over there. Well, it's very, very hard for you from the back end perspective to figure it out. So this is where this notion of VM archiving comes in. Again, go back and touch the data, you can collect as much information about it as you can and then reuse for other purposes. So basically what it is, is the same thing. How do you know how to decommission those VMs, when to decommission these VMs? And bigger issue over here, especially from a storage user perspective is, they're all sitting there on a tier one data store because guess what, at least on an engineering focused organizations like us, developers get tier one storage. They don't get, you know, JBoss and everything else. They get really, really fast storage. And if I have my tier one storage sitting over there and all of those VMs are sitting there, <coughs> how do I reclaim all that back? I have no idea what this means, by the way. Our marketing guys put it in there, but I don't know what that guy is. What's that guy that's how you deal with a developer who doesn't retire as VMs. Yeah. Thanks. Actually, that's <laughs> more like a developer. Well. <laughs> that's our developer there. What they don't show you is a marketing guy. Um, all right. But here, that's the basic idea we are on. So you've gone in, you've defined your data protection policies, you've gone in, you've done automatic discovery and so on and so forth. So all of your VMs are getting protected and you're backing it up all the time, not knowing who's getting used and whatnot. So we've introduced this notion of VM archiving where when we back up those VMs, so we do the single pass over here which goes and says, identify all the change blocks as part of my data protection. I go in, back it up. Then I go in and say, all right, but out of these VMs, which ones are really being used? So we monitor things like CPU usage, disk utilization, network utilization, and so on and so forth on individual VMs and go back in and say, hey, you know what? This VM is not being used for a whole, but I think it's not being used for a while. So let me go ahead and just power it off. I'm not going to do anything with the VM. Just go back and power it off. And then if the user needs it, it gets powered back up and then you're also fine. If the okay, VM gets powered off and still not been touched for X number of days based on a policy, I go ahead and say, I'm not going to keep it on my tier one storage. I'm going to go back in, storage vMotion it or copy it off to a secondary tier one storage over here. 
So I take it from the VMDK from a tier one, keep it to tier two. It's still in my VMDK context. It's still in my V in my V center context, virtual infrastructure context. Can you reverse the order of these operations? So can you say I want to shift it to cheaper storage, but yeah. keep it on, and then it's, say, okay, now so I want to turn it off. Potentially, yes. Right now, we don't touch anything if it's powered up. It's intentional. We don't want to touch, you know, because if if it's powered up, if I power it down, the worst case, you power it back up, and you're fine. If I move it off somewhere else, so it's 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 doable. We intentionally didn't do it this way right now. And by the way, this is an optional step. I don't even have to do this. Well, and to me, it, it's less intrusive to move from fat, uh, tier one storage to tier two storage with like storage vMotion right. than it would be to actually power off a VM that possibly could be used for something. Right. Right. But but hold on to that thought though, because powering up a VM is is also not that difficult when you come to a web console capabilities. So, but but it's short answer. Yes, it's doable. Uh, we just haven't sequenced it that way. But it's a very very simple thing to turn it around. To basically just say it's not being used. Let me move it over here. And if it's still around, if it's still up, it's up. Right. But if you actually power off a, a, an existing VM that's being used, then I have to explain why I had a downtime so, event. Yeah. So uh, the criteria for power off is pretty strict that way. So let, we, we'll sh I'll show some of the criteria there, and then it's. As long as we have the engine to do that, the criteria is very easy to modify. And uh, so far, what we've seen is, from a, from a backup admin's perspective, they are less, uh, at least from a storage, we, we, from a storage guy perspective, they are reluctant to move from tier one to tier two. Although I would have thought that would have been the easy thing decision to do, but that's that's kind of the feedback we're beginning there is. Let's leave it there. It's easier to power it up first before you do that, but not a big deal to reverse it. Question. Okay. No, it's, um, I'm just still trying to trying to figure that out. Powering off VMs is also what's often described as a scream test to identify the zombie VM. You just power it off, and nobody screams. It was a zombie. Correct. Shoot it. <laughs> <laughs> you saying that that, that's the that's archer again? It was crazy. on the wrong slide. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so you're saying maybe if they moved it, the the owner wouldn't identify. It's still sitting. Person. It's still consuming CPU and memory. So philosophically, you want it shut down and yeah. Yeah. teared down. But yeah, that's another way to put it. It's basically if nobody complains about it, I'm okay to do anything I want with it. Because that's a that's one of coming from an archive background. Because we also have an archive product, that was a one hesitation that most people have with archiving. Is that anytime you go touch production, you're taking control away from end users, or the per there's a perception that end users don't own that data anymore, and they basically throw a fit at that point, whether they're using that data or not. As long as it goes from the control of this tier over here to this tier, that's where things start getting a little tricky. So it's one of those early screen tests. Now, it's sitting here in my tier two, migrated and everything else, and still not being used for a while. So we go back and basically say, why is it even sitting on my VM infrastructure? Let me go back in, pull only the VMDK. I'm not going to take the virtual machines. So the virtual machine still exists in the vCenter context, but I'm going to take the VMDK and put the VMDK into my content store repository in the back end there. So I've powered up the VM, so I've freed up the CPU cycles on that, so potentially I could do more on the same ESX host. I've moved it from tier one to tier two, so I could potentially have more uh, IOPS available on the tier one. And then as a last step, I've moved it completely off, so I'm not using tier one and tier two at all, I'm using my archive storage in the back end there. That object continues to exist, and it's still there. Now, most of the times what we've seen is when this happens, People usually want the machine back, not because they want the machine back, but because they had certain files in there that they needed recovered. So you can go back in, regardless of whether it's sitting here or in this tier here, you can still go back in and pull individual files from that VM that belonged into that VM without actually doing a full recall. So the VM can stay in an archive state and I can go back in and I can browse individual files and pull them out and restore them and make it available to end users. So effectively, once you've solved that, you basically said, end user, you have not lost access to your data. It's still there. You can go back in and pull any time and pull data from there at any time you want. That kind of satisfies a whole bunch of concerns down there. This flow can be used also on uh, other type of uh, object, for example, uh, template that uh, you don't use. Sure or uh, ISO images that you have put on data store. Uh, this is li little different. <laughs> yeah. For now, VMDK is because we don't have, so our VSA agent mm -hmm. is in backup ISOs. Yeah. But if you are using my NAS 
uh, IDA for instance, mm -hmm. uh, that is using the NFS interfaces to back it up, then yes, I can do archiving okay. on that one as well. So here is the criteria. Now, this is the criteria based on what we talked over here. This is the criteria for powering it down. If the CPU usage is below X percent for so many days, it's not just it goes drops below once. It's been <coughs> consistently below this threshold for X number of days. The disk usage has been consistently below, consistently below this threshold for X number of days and so on. That's when I go in and manage and, and, and use that VM for uh, you know, archive processing effectively. Is there a maximum on that? I just got a comment from Tim in, in Twitter about in some environments there's going to be a long lead time <coughs> while we're waiting for app integration or something from the VM being deployed to it actually going live. So the VMs could show up as, as idle for a month. You can basically tune it up to basically say there's, there is no max to this, right? Right. And then again, the thing so is. It's stored in a double, so it right. can be the lifetime of the universe days turned off or by load. Yeah. And the other thing over here is too is. Depending on how your provisioning goes through, probably when it's in that state over there, you're not backing it up. So this thing applies <coughs> over here to only VMs that we have under management from a data protection perspective. So if it's not within my scope, I'm not going to go and touch anything with it. And I guess if this machine is sitting around idle for a month, it would actually be a really good thing to throw down onto my tier two storage until it starts actually do, doing right. some real work. Do we have automated promote backup again? Yes. So from the web console, you can actually have it. So it's a manual. Re effectively, it's a restore back. back yeah. But when you restore it back, you can choose where it, where it goes to. This is kind of the migration process over there. And the last thing that I don't have a screenshot for is basically after X number of days, archive it off to my tier two or my disk storage in the back end here, which could also be cloud storage, by the way. Again, S3 goes in S3, and I can power it up in S3 tier two. All right. So how are we doing in time? Very good. What the last piece that I wanted to show from a VM lifecycle management perspective, again, it goes back to I've, I've put my data protection policies in there. I know a lot about the virtual infrastructure. What else can I do with it? Now, I have the ability to capture change blocks. I've got it all, 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 I have it all under management. I have the ability to provision servers as part of the virtualize me promotion over there. So I can actually go talk to the various VS infrastructure elements and go ahead and create servers for a DR purpose. Now, if that's the case, why I'd limit this thing only for DR purposes? Because essentially it's the same thing. I can go back in and effectively provision not just a server that looks like my physical server. Basically, I can provision any server. Right? So what I want to do here is quickly shift, shift a little bit to uh, We talked about the Commodore Web Console. Right. So Commodore Web Console is not limited just to VM data. Basically, the, the idea there is that I have everything in my content repository, and I want to expose as much data as possible to end users. <coughs> so whether it is you know, you're backing up your laptops, or your files, your virtual machines, your NAS filers, or whatnot, anything that you have permissions for will show up in this Web Console. So anytime you need your data, you don't ever have to call into IT. You go to this thing over here, not just from your source location, but from any location, including one of these over there, and then go back in and pull your data out from there. Right? So what I have here is basically, let's see, under my data, this is, again, this goes uh, before I get into the my data. It's not just about your data, it's about how is my data doing. So I can provide a whole slew of reports about what we are doing from a data management perspective for your data sets too. How much data do you have? How much of it's getting backed up? How much of it's getting retained? How much does it cost us to back up this data or retain this data? Right? Whole slew of reports, and I'm not going to go in there right now. This is the traditional Commvault uh, Java console, which <coughs> most admins, if you have permissions to it, you will see it, but most end users do not have permissions to view this, so it won't even show up in their web console. I am admin, so I kind of get all the applets over here, but most end users will see this this to some extent and the last thing that I'll show over here is my virtual machines right and your role-based access control is all buried in can it be 
So application side, is it directory side? Where, where can it's, that reside? It's active directory based. Uh, there we have provisioning mechanisms where once a virtual machine is created, we can actually pull ownership information of that virtual machine and retain that inside my context over here. So when somebody logs into this console using that AD profile, they'll only see VMs or files that they are they have access to, basically. Do you have any other uh, third-party tie-ins to other like self-service, service center style things like? Well, I can name a host of products. I won't burn through them. Yeah. Not, they're not here. So, <laughs> uh, but yeah, like basically API-driven access that could carry through the role-based access yes. control. Yes. So that's not. So if you look at a lot of our service providers, they they want something like this, but they want this plus all of their other tenant management interface over there. So what they've basically taken is they've taken all of this and plugged it into their portals. All of this is exposed through APIs. So what they've done is gone ahead and created their own portal. This is our implementation of that portal that doesn't include a whole bunch of other things. But yes, all of this is basically API driven in the back end. Good answer. <laughs> right, so if I go into my data, most of our la desktop laptop users, if their workstations are being backed up, their, their computers will show up over here. This is a lab environment, so I've, I've logged in with a profile that has only one machine over here, that's less desktop laptop. If I go into my other profile, which is my corporate profile, you'll see all of my laptops, three of those devices over here show up, and then go inside each one of those and browse my files and pick up data and so on and so forth. These over here are the virtual machines that I've created, that I'm responsible for. And I'll talk about how I provision it in a second over here, but basically these are the machines that I'm owner of. This here shows me the protection state. So uh, Amber means they haven't been protected for a while because there's something going on in the lab. We haven't been running a backup jobs, but basically it shows me if, if it's been protected, it shows me it's green. If it's powered up, if it's powered off, and if it's archived, you see this over here. So these machines have actually been archived off. So for, from an end user perspective, they still exist, but if you want to you know, access those, you go in back in here, I'll show you in a second. You go back in there, you basically say bring this back. So if I go into this VM, and this also shows you when was it last backed up, you know, almost 12 days ago. That's why this is Amber. When is the next backup scheduled to run? And what was the last backup size? Megs, that, that VM is actually a 200 gig VM, but I backed up so many megs over there. Obviously not a lot of changes happening. And this one here, of course, because it's archived out, I'm not backing it up anymore. Size on that is zero. Now, if I go into the VM analytics, Right. So, there are the machine IP address, OS, whatever information I can create. Here are the owners of the VM. So, me, of course, and I've added additional owners to it. So, anybody who logs in with any of, so these users, when they log in with these credentials, they will also see the VMs over there. Right? Uh, some more details on what the machine looks like and so on and so forth. Uh, and so on. I can click over here if I want to recover data. Doesn't matter whether the VM is uh, available or not, whether it's uh, running or archived off, I can hit select files, it'll show me a nice browsable view of, of all the files that I need to recover and bring it back. If, I, if the VM is archived off, if I have the logo over there, I basically go in and say recover virtual machine. It says, how do you want to bring it back up? I hit OK, fires off a recovery job in the back end there. It's a nice progress, but I'm not going to trigger it off because there's some tests going on in the back end I don't want to disrupt. But all of this is end user driven, right? So it's your, you are the VM owner and you're doing this by yourself. You don't have to depend on IT at all. Now, to go back over here, goes back to VM lifecycle management, not just backup management. All of the VM management functionality, pause the VM, start a VM, refresh a VM, edit nodes, delete the VM, renew the lease on the VM. So when I create VMs, VMs automatically come with, with a bit, depending on what policy I've set, they come with a default lifetime. You can go and renew it. This is saying, and then the last thing over here is basically create a software snapshot. So if I'm a developer and I've provisioned a VM over here and I need to test a service pack or whatever, I don't want to create a full backup copy. I just want to create a very quick software snapshot. Today, the only way to do this is actually going to vCenter and create a snapshot on that VM. In this context here, I go to this web console and create a snapshot. I can create three or four of those. This will actually go create a VMware software snapshot inside VMs vCenter. 
then I can go create and list all the snapshots, view the snapshots, and even revert back to the current snapshot. Do you guys have a <clears throat> not just pure API, but do you expose like a CLI base? So can yes. we use it with PowerCLI or PowerShell or, or other integration? Yeah. So CLI from CLI and API for us is the same thing. Basically, our API is XML wrappers around a CLI. Right. Uh, so it makes it very web friendly and everything else. Basically, it's 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 the same infrastructure. API is another wrapper on top of the CLI. So basically any, but there's not like a set of PowerShell commandlets that you guys already have baked in. We would just have to make RESTful calls through Correct. whatever language of choice and, yes. and that would do what we yep. need to do. Okay. Exactly right. So is it easy for me to put some policy around those snapshots? Or are they just going to take 100 snapshots and leave them there? No, so whatever is the default policy. Right now, uh, right now there isn't. Uh, uh, there is one one enhancement that I have from a customer is actually exa asking exactly for that, is they want to limit the number of snaps that end users create. Yeah, right, because um, I can see them just snapshotting all the time before they do anything, and then none of them ever get removed. Yeah, that's actually one of the one of the first uh, enhancement requests that I got when I demoed this. To to do those snapshots, so there has to be some sort of authentication that's sent to the vCenter. Quite. So it's me that's doing it. It's in the, the back administrator end. service or whatever. It's the it's the service account. Okay, it's so not the user who's it's logged not the in user, here. Correct. Got it. okay. It's a service account that's doing it. But the nice thing about this is I'm doing all of this, I'm doing basic VM management, but I don't have to expose my infrastructure to the VM guys, or to the end users. I don't have to expose ESX servers, data stores, resource pools, none of that stuff. I can right. do all of that in the back of it. So that kind of masks it, masks, masks it out. Isn't, I mean, is that, so you're, this is a, a replacement for a self-service portal type thing? This is our self-service portal where one of the things you can do is you can recover your data, but you can also manage your own VMs. Could you and spin up new VMs? Yes, thank you. Perfect segue to... That wasn't practiced. Uh, no. I can actually go back and remote desktop into it, of course, from here. But... I can find the mouse. Oh, there it is. By the way, I can add more users to it as well from here. Add new machine. No, oh, no, this is my add a new physical server. I have a question from uh, Twitter. Did you mention that you were able to P to V with this? Yes. Tool too. Okay. P2V, yes, so basically using my uh, uh, my virtualized me, I am, if I'm backing up that physical server, I can recover it back as a virtual server over there in the back too. No, I remember that. I, I think the, he was asking about this through this interface, through this portal. Not through this portal over here. Okay. Not right now. Uh, but uh, one of the things we're looking to do is that restore option there for physical server. I can actually, uh, the, the, ch the challenge right now with P2V is you just need to expose the infrastructure. The virtual infrastructure. So we're kind of working through that right now. But yeah, that's definitely a good uh, uh, good segue into when I go into virtual machines. Here are all the virtual machines, not my data, but my virtual machines. And inside there, I can create virtual machine. Right. So when I create a virtual machine, it's not that you can create any kind of virtual machine. What we've done in the back over here first is, as, as an administrator, you set up a provisioning policy first. So you said, I want users to be able to create only virtual machines that have, the name should look like this. There's the default expiration on that. How many VMs to create and whatnot. But when I go through this here, next you can say, which templates that you can create on. So I've ingested a few templates in there and you can use those templates to create that. Administrator password. My policy has dictated that you can only add four gigs of RAM to it. So my slide will only allow you to do four gigs, anywhere from two to four gigs. You can only add two CPUs. You can only add so many NICs over there. Disks layout, maximum disk size you can have is 200 gigs. Now you decide how to break it up over there based on number of disks you want. 
memory and when I hit finish it's going to provision a VM it's going to show up in my VM list over there that I saw and it's automatically also going to get added to my data protection policy so because my data protection policy is automatically set to discover all VMs that show up in this particular location over here next time a backup runs it will also back it up over there we wanted to tie in uh, an orchestration platform like VCO or VCake to this. Would you do it to run this whole process, or would it be easier for us to have our traditional orchestration for the VM creation, and mm -hmm. then at the end, just do a one-time REST call to actually add it to the protection suite? You don't even have to do a REST call. As long as you provision the VM in a location, we have what's called automatic discovery policy, so your, your data protection policies are tied to not individual VMs, but to uh, VM entities, okay. resource pools, clusters, folders, data stores, ESX servers, and there's like a few others. So as long as it shows up and as long as there's a backup policy associated with it, that VM automatically gets swept into my protection policy. Okay. Right. So I'm going to cancel out of this one here. So you can see the evolution of where the platform is going. Data protection is just one thing we do, but it's all the data that we capture that allows us to do this additional thing over here. Our, uh, my entire engineering team in the back is actually using this now. Uh, they're not using going to vCenter or whatnot. Uh, in fact, uh, most of them under the covers don't even know what virtualization platform is being used. 